Okay. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today for the webinar series, Ecosystem Resilience, um, titled Native American Cultural Burning. Uh, this is in partnership between the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center and the Center for Climate Adaptation Science Solutions. Uh, my name is Althea Walker. I'm the Tribal Climate Science Liaison um, for the American Indian Higher Education Consortium at um, the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and so thank you all for joining us today. Um, to give you some background on the two organizations, um, the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center or the Southwest CASP was established in 2011 to provide objective scientific information, tools and techniques that land, water, wildlife, and cultural resource managers and other interested parties can apply to anticipate, monitor, and adapt to climate change impacts here in the southwestern United States. Our partner for this webinar series, the Center for Climate Adaptation Science and Solutions, or better known as CCAS, is to strengthen and support adaptation, risk management, and resilience efforts at multiple scales by providing intellectual leadership, training, and engagement with a focus on solutions. Um, and to uh, give you some more background on the Southwest CASC, uh, we are, um, it, it, we're a collaborative partnership between the USGS and a consortium of seven academic institutions from across the region, um, which the University of Arizona is the host institution. We also partner with Colorado State University, Desert Research Institute, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego, UC Davis, UCLA, and Utah State University. Uh, the, South, the Southwest CASC also partners with the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, or better known as AHEC, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Resiliency Program, um, in which supports my position as a tribal climate liaison um, for the Southwest region. Uh, AHEC is a collective spirit and unifying voice of the tribal colleges and universities across the nation. Um, so before I introduce our presenters, I just wanted to um, oops, let everybody know that um, there will be time at the um, end of the presentations, both presentations, to um, for question and answer. And uh, you can enter your question and answer or questions at any time at the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, and all questions will be addressed at the end of uh, the presentation. So to introduce you to um, Honorable Ron Good, he is a veteran of the U.S. Army and a retired professor in ethnic studies. Ron was a coordinating lead author for the California Fourth Climate Change Assessment. Mr. Good volunteers his time to enhance the ecological environment, watersheds, and cultural resources of the forests, parks, and tribal lands. Ron and his tribal members have been restoring cultural resource sites for the past 25 years. Um, and our second presenter for today is Dr. Beth Rose Middleton, uh, Afro-Caribbean, Eastern European, and is the Associate Professor and Chair of Native American Studies at UC Davis and is one of our Southwest CASC investigators. Her research centers on Native environmental policy and Native activism for site protect protection using conservation tools. So our first presenter today will be um, Honorable Ron Good, and I will stop sharing my screen. Um, and Ron, you can begin to share yours. Are we on? Yes, yeah. you may start sharing your screen. Okay, I did already. Um, we're looking for the video. We're going to start with a little video and then we'll get into the presentation. Ron, we can't see your screen yet. You can't see my screen? Nope. No? Not yet. We're burning to restore the Where's land. Where's that screen at? Restore the resources. Restore water. So if you try to like, clean back the Sour berry, which is a three leaf sumac, both of them are dying and they you see it now? Yes, yeah, we can see it. You want to restart the video. Yeah, burn it. Thank you. 
cultural we're burning to restore the land restore the resources restore water today we're burning the red bud and sourberry which is a three-leaf sumac both of them are dying and they need new growth and in order to get that we burn it cultural burning is a traditional land stewardship tool employed by indigenous people all over the world and it has a very strong history and contemporary practice in california For the students to not only observe him as a land steward and to listen to his knowledge and the way he approached the work, but also to then be involved alongside him and to be guided by him in those methods really went even uh, beyond what I had planned for the class. Bringing you folks in class from UC Davis gives us an opportunity to share with you our traditional ecological knowledge and practice and see it firsthand. I keep telling everybody that for centuries when the Indians burned all the time, then they could they could come through and do a broadcast burn underneath, burn all these sourberries without burning the tree. There's no doubt that fire suppression is one of the leading causes for the fires that we're seeing today in California that are so uh, damaging to communities. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, starting in the mid 19th century, but really in the early 1900s, native people were prevented from burning across their traditional homelands. And now we're just seeing the result of that policy. We started this morning with a blessing. We started this morning by asking all our relatives out here permission to come out here. I'm not out here to destroy them, I'm out here to restore and make new life. The thing is that fires are going to burn whether we want them to or not. What we learn from cultural burning practices is that Native American communities have learned to use fire to their advantage. We need to also learn how to use fire to benefit society. I see a lot of hope in collaborative uh, partnerships where we find state and private funding in which people can work together to prepare the land for a burn. So do that thinning, take out the overgrowth and the underbrush, do that raking and piling and burning before you can implement a burn. I think that's key. I think people need to be educated about what the land looked like for many years. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for allowing us this time to be able to share with you a little bit of our practices and our knowledge. We've um, been working and doing this type of work for quite a few years. Um, past couple of decades working all around with on tribal lands, private lands, federal lands, state lands, county lands, trying to implement cultural burning and sharing with people what cultural burning means, what it uh, can do. When we go back into history, into time, we look at the the Indian people who lived on the land for thousands and thousands of years and continually burnt all the time. I have researchers uh, who are out and, and researching history of fire and are constantly saying, well, there's no footprint. There's no footprint. We can't, we can't find where the Indians burned all the time. Uh, well, on, on the other hand, 
the way that they burned, you couldn't tell where they burned all the time because their fires didn't get away from them and their fires didn't scorch trees and and leave a mark on on where they were burning. They burnt what they needed to burn and constantly burned. This is um, a practice and a procedure in which I've been trying for the past three to five years to implement within parks and forced um, to at this point in time. It has not been implemented, but we continually try to express to them the, the need to rethink how they burn. My burn friends and burn buddies with the forest and the park, they, they want to go out and light up 10,000 acres whenever they burn and, and they're not interested in burning 10 acres. They're not interested in burning 10 acres a day. They don't see the value of what that can do on a, on a daily or basis and, and annually year after year. So consequently, instead of burning 10,000, they barely get 1,500 acres. And that doesn't even happen every year. So there we are, you know, it's a big difference of uh, what types of practices that, that we once did and where we are now. So this is part of where we are slowly trying to bring uh, these concepts back in and implementing them into our practices today. So our, my team has grown over the years and we do restoration work on, on meadows, on cultural resources. Uh, with the Sierra National Forest, we have six meadows in which we have actually uh, restored. And that means that we brought the water back. Uh, four of those six meadows were what we call non-existent. They, they were not functioning and so they were not functioning at a level to where they were even being considered a meadow. But we have fully returned the water to these meadow systems and everything that comes with it. So uh, one of my key phrases is that if you build it, they will come. So we start out by monitoring these sites and record uh, the species that are there, plants and and insects and birds and animals. And then we might have, you know, 15 to 20 different species on, on the land. But when we get done, we're somewhere between 150 and 160 different species. That doesn't mean that, you know, that's how many ladybugs they are because we end up with thousands of ladybugs and, you know, several different kinds of, uh, praying mantis and all these different things that will happen when the meadow gets uh, rebuilt and restored to where you want to go. So that's a part of where we're at and um, putting fire on the land. So it's important that we put fire out there and in many times people have a trouble trying to explain you know how we burn and i have a lot of uh, folks that are constantly well they do pile burning now we try not to say that we do pile burning because that's what the force does they do pile burning and they burn you know 30 foot high piles and basically their fire burns so hot that nothing gets restored there's nothing get comes back and the concept that we're doing when you put fire on the land you need immediate return here in this we see a nice full red bud what it will look like and how beautiful it looks except the fact that it's not useful as a resource can't get any sticks out of them to make baskets or or do anything else with them because at that point in time they're going into their dying stage when it's that big and that that full so here's what have here's what it looks like when we get into the dying stage i've been bringing colleges in from all over the state for 
many years and uh, UC Davis has been partnering with us for a few years now. This is my nephew and I've been training him for about 10 years. I've got a couple of other family members that uh, we've been working with and bringing them along. And so, you know, teaching them uh, how to do fire. In our old system, we have um, about when you're up to about 25 into say 35 is when you're actually learning to do things like build fire and, and put fire on the land. Um, from that point forward, then you actually become the burner until you get up and do my age now to where you become the teacher. And again, the idea to for the restoration and we're building new life is to see an immediate return. And in this case, that was the red bud nine months later. And we'll see how much harvest we have already had from that uh, a year or two later. And again, in 2019, you can see, continue to see the growth. This was our volunteer group in February of 2019 with UC Davis, uh, Kenyatta College and Middlebury um, students. Fresno State, and you can see over here on the right side where uh, Lois is, and she was gathering redbud, and that's enough to get her started to make a couple of baskets. When we talk about the need to burn, and this bush, while it looks a little green, it is not producing, uh, the berry food is not producing fiber. It, uh, and being attacked by a parasite or two, in this case, lichen, and sometimes a California daughter. So we come in and then we prep the burn. Um, this is all full of the berry bushes. And so if we light it up, we'll probably light up Mariposa while we're at it. So you have to break it down into areas that you can handle and manage. It takes a lot of work to prep. I start out with my children. Every burn I have, I have at least 10 children uh, of all different ages out. This is my granddaughter. I bring in agencies from whoever wants to come, every walk of life, come on in, you know, and here is really nice to have folks like uh, the University of California Ag Resource Extension folks. This is uh, another nephew that is a, a firefighter and I'm bringing him down to retrain him. And then also Chris from UC Davis. We're again looking at why are we restoring the three-leaf sumac? Well, you can see what it looks like. <laughs> There's a uh, pretty much, it's pretty much gone, right? So we put a little fire to it. This year when we burned, we, this is a picture of what it uh, was looking like and put some fire to it, burn it up to the middle. When we're all done, you can see the spots out there and the size of the spots which, which we burned. This is what your burn should look like when you get done with it. You shouldn't see ash. You shouldn't see uh, wood or anything left out there. And two months later, wait a minute, we missed something here someplace along the line. What happened here? Sorry about that. Okay, well, I'll have to go with it. <laughs> Seems like I'm missing a page. All right, two months later, um, you see the young, the sprouts coming back up, but you also see other plants that are coming out, and many times you'll find medicine plants coming out as well. This is uh, 
My nephew, he's getting ready to do his burn. He fires it up. Gets pretty hot. And my other nephew taking a look at things, trying to find some new sprouts. He found one. This is one month after the burns. And back to the two months after the burns. And look at all the flowers that came up. Um, in and next to it and and the, all that pasture was also burned we say we burn down to burning the resource down while it may appear that we're burning it up we're bringing it down to the root system so that the root system can be restored we make sure that everything is clipped everything is done and ready to for regrowth, it takes a lot of work, a lot of tedious work to get out and clip all the little root systems and everything else, rake it all up, bring in some topsoil and make a new nutrient out of it, get that site all prepared after it's been burned, ready for water, we mix the topsoil, that new nutrient going, get some water on it, and wait for it to grow. Of course, we gotta take a little time out, have a little social time, talk it over, and you got the chiefs talking here. A picture of some of my other college group coming in from Middlebury, and uh, one of my samurai students in the back. <laughs> Just to get quick idea of who all we have there, of your different organizations we we bring in from the Forest Service and you know Clovis Judo Club and state agencies and uh, Prescott and Cal Fire and UC Davis and North Fork Mono Tribe. A number of folks are been coming and doing documentary work uh, on what we have been doing. We got a number of tribes. We got about, what, eight different tribes that came in. Um, so you can see what UC Davis this year came in and, and really helped out. And they brought in some, some funders and some support. And that's who we're working with today. And I want to give them an extra thank you. Um, the Climate Adaption, uh, Adaptation Science Center at the University of Arizona. Um, just, uh, just fantastic what they've been able to do to help us. Uh, you see Greenville Rancheria, Nature Conservancy, um, the State Forest Management Task Force. So, um, you know, very important that we get as many different people to come and see what we've been doing um, we also hold and host a ceremony before we start on Saturdays, and this this time around we did a nice little workshop in which we invited a number of folks to to come in and, and speak with us. I've got some of our elders have come in to join in with us, and so we set up a pretty nice little uh, elaborate kitchen. You can see you got about four different canopies there and got your snacks and your drinks and your lunch and our Cal Fire archaeologist is there. We had a number of archaeologists with us out there. This is a good friend of mine that uh, was one of my students that came to train with me in meadow restoration a few years back. She's going to Minnesota to get her degree. She flew all the way in from Mariposa to be with us. Mariposa from Minnesota <laughs> to Mariposa. Okay. And oh, Chef Mo, Chief Mo, and his lunch, Danny does a great job. We hire our own cooks. How about that? I mean, this is a big operation. And smoke on the land, very important. When we're setting fires out there, that smoke helps to deter the um, par parasites like. Um, uh, mistletoe and 
California dodder and any other thing that's uh, affecting our trees. Another thing that you'll see here that I don't talk too much about is the see-through concept. When you get done, you should be able to see through on the land. Remember, right, all these places, these rocks out here, they all have some sort of archaeological uh, remnants of when our people lived on the land. So they lived here. You had to be keep track of your children, your two-year-old, your five-year-old, your 12-year-old, because the bear and lion live out here too. When our burns are all complete and they're ready to go, this is what they should look like. Every time we do a burn, we find some sort of uh, artifacts or archaeological remnants of, of the people that once lived there. They burned their village too. They burned their lands because they had to keep them clear. This time we did a really nice three acre burn and we included with our 13 uh, patch burns and we ended up finding medicine rocks and house pits and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, this village here, we figure at one point in time, at least 600 people once lived on this 40 to 50 acre village site. You'll find cooking rocks, you'll find all sorts of different things when we get done. Go back to the very beginning when you saw that little red car back there uh, from two years ago, this is the return. This is the return on the red bud. Oh, this is what it's supposed to look like when we get done, ready to eat. But we still have invasives that come and are coming after us called the California daughter. And um, so we have, even though we've burned it a couple of times, uh, we still have to keep after it. They're tough. And as I said before, we look to the monitoring of all the different kinds of species. And every time that we're out there, we upgrade it to where we're about at 91 now, different, different uh, uh, species on the land. And after we burn, we'll get more. Of course, this is what it's really all about, is bringing that water back. When we restore the plants and we restore the land, then that will be have the ability to hold water in the roots. When it can hold water in the root system, it has a, a, a slower, process and mechanism in which it will be able to continually keep water available. You can also see where we burned here up on the top left corner and a lot of our willows were still dying and a lot of um, star thistle and we had overgrown of tarweed so we lit it up, put a little fire on the land, a little smoke, and voila, look at that. Uh, this is what you get two months later. Two months later, this is what she looks like out there. And you can see my granddaughter enjoy picking the flowers. So when we got done with the burn, this is what it looked like. One month later, you can see the greenery starting to come back. And two months later, two months later, this is what your burn should look like. This is, we're, remember, we're restoring, we're, we're, we're giving a new life. And uh, this, this elderberry bush over here, uh, we actually harvested from it. We cleaned it up a little bit. We also found a medicine rock underneath it. And so we brought some sticks home and, and made some hand clappers out of them with, now that we're locked down with the uh, COVID-19, we have to find things to do. So here I am making hand clappers with my granddaughters. And this is how they came out. Each one painting their own and doing their own designs. They're ready for song. This is my least but not the end here is to look at the strawberry bush. This is what's gonna be coming up this summer. I can't wait to get out there and harvest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron.
Um, and I'm just going to take a couple questions right now um, that were put in the chat box. And the first question um, is, does the Forest Service or Park Service require a fire boss or other government personnel on site when you burn? Uh, I am the fire boss, but no, no and, and yes in a sense because I do what is supposed to be done. All right, and another question was, why do they cut the roots or why do you cut the roots? Why do we cut the roots? That's, yeah. I'm sorry if I said that. Um, we burn down to the root system. We don't cut the roots out. That's that's the whole point of you. The you want the roots to to be and to grow back. That's why we have a return in one month and two months because the root system is not cut. All right, thank not you. damaged, not burned. Okay, thank you for clarifying that one. And then the last question uh, is, is: Cultural burning different between flat plains versus mountain forested environments? No. Okay. There's a little hesitation on that no because your burning, you know, pertains to whatever your area will look like. And so while you saw the three acre burn there, that may be something a little bit lower down in the more grassier flatlands. That's what that would look like. Uh, the higher up you go, you won't have as much of uh, that as you will the different cultural resources that you're restoring and and each cultural resource is dirt different and so the video showed you uh, we were burning a red bud and how you burn the red bud the sourberry bushes are different the elderberry bushes are all different each one has to have its own fire in, in its own way all right thank you for taking those few questions and just a reminder to everybody um, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen if you want to enter yours there, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Um, and Ron, if you want to stop sharing your screen, and I invite Beth Rose to start sharing hers. Okay, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be speaking alongside Ron Good. We've had a wonderful time working together and I'm excited to share a little bit about that. So I'm going to be speaking more about the education and collaboration aspects that we have been building with Ron and UC Davis and the Climate Adaptation Science Center. So just a little context, this is from the NCA National Climate Assessment for and you can see the increase in catastrophic wildfire, both with and without climate change. And this is uh, you know, supported, fostered by a century of, of fire suppression and active exclusion of indigenous land stewardship methods, including cultural burning and low intensity burning. We live in a time of increasing risk of catastrophic fire. And there's a need I think many recognize of acknowledging, respecting, and uh, learning alongside and with indigenous ingenuity or indigenuity, as I like to quote uh, Professor Dan Wildcat at Haskell. So there's a lot written about cultural burning. Uh, leading, leading academic and practitioner science shows the effectiveness of burning, as Ron was just showing us, for increasing habitat, raising the water table, improving overall ecosystem health, improving the number of species, reducing the risk of catastrophic fire, uh, and many other co-benefits. And I just listed some of the resources. Uh, I really point to the work of Frank Lake, Don Hankins, uh, Jonathan Long, Kat Anderson, uh, Ron Good, Jared Aldrin, uh, Danny Manning, uh, many others, Chris Adlam. So there is a lot of wonderful reading that can be done about about the importance of cultural burning and some of the impacts. Uh, what we have been doing and, uh, at UC Davis is developing both a course and a series of workshops. I want to acknowledge Chris Adlam, PhD student in ecology, 
uh, who's really been a driving force with this work, and you saw him and his son in some of the slides that Ron was sharing. Melinda Adams, who is a PhD student in Native American Studies. Denise Martinez, who is a PhD student in Ecology. We have all been working to, to build out this project. So with creating a field course, especially one associated with cultural burning, with fire, with working together on the land, there are a lot of considerations and the same with the public workshop aspect. Building the collaborations, um, you know, many of us already had had been working together. I knew Ron and Diana Elmanderas and uh, Don Hankins and other collaborators from previous work and uh, Chris built relationships with them as well. So developing the collaboration in a way that there will be mutual benefits in a way that's respectful. Um, finding funding, I'm really grateful for the support of the Climate Adaptation Science Center, as well as the Yochidihi Endowment at UC Davis that's helped support a lot of the costs associated with this class and with the workshops, bringing people to the site, any costs associated with, with the site, with camping, with food, being able to host people, being able to support presenters, uh, and also just the incredible amount of, of time. This is really a uh, a labor of love and a collaborative process between UC Davis and partners off campus to develop these workshops in the course. We're guided by principles of, of hands-on learning and learning together out on the land, recognizing the expertise of indigenous cultural fire practitioners and working, working with reciprocity. So ensuring that we are giving back, that the students are supporting projects that community members are leading, that we're finding funding to support community members and, and uh, the expertise of practitioners. And some of the learning outcomes that guide the course and they're available in this report, which Chris is lead author on, which we just finished. Uh, we will provide that to CASC and share it so that you all can see it. Uh, but we foster student learning on the ecological importance of fire, um, the policy context for cultural burning, and um, cross-cultural relationship building for land stewardship. So these are the outcomes that we want students, that we want people participating in the course to walk away with and in the workshops. Uh, you saw a few of these pictures in the video and listening to Ron, but the first time I was able to bring a class out from UC Davis was in 2018, and it was uh, California Indian Environmental Policy. And we came out for a weekend, and as you saw in the video, we learned from Ron, worked with Ron to burn these sourberry and redwood bush, redbud bushes. And you can see students were involved in, in cutting and piling, preparing the land, and then in burning, uh, and then in raking mixing in the ash and then when we came back we were also there in 2019 but then when we, we were there again in 2020 uh, we were able to work with three weavers uh, from Dunlap Momo, Mono, Gladys McKinney, Julie Tex and Florence Dick to harvest from those same uh, bushes that we had burned two years prior so it was a really wonderful experience and this was part of our public workshop so it included both students and community members. We had another workshop at the Cache Creek Nature Preserve. Uh, this is a, fly, a flyer about that. Uh, we burned redbud uh, and deer grass. Um, we had, uh, we had uh, participants there from multiple nations, multiple fire crews. This is Danny Manning from Greenville Rancheria Fire Crew and a man from Shingle Springs uh, participating in burning the Thule along the restored wetland area there. Uh, I think being able to do the workshop here just reflects a lot of collaboration over time, building a relationship with the nature preserve, with the weavers at the tending and gathering garden, and being able to go out together um, and, and burn the plants for, for the health of the plants and for their use by the weavers. So that's Chris Adlam with Ardith Reed and Diana Almanderas uh, lighting the deer grass there. So some of the outcomes, some of the student responses to hands-on learning with fire practitioners, I just included a few quotes here. I know some of the students may be on and listening, so you might uh, see your words. Uh, the class made me rethink my entire notion of environmental health. Another said, this reframing of ecology and fire has shifted the way I think of myself in relation to the land. Thinking in this way emphasizes responsibility and connectedness that for me has grounded my perspective and aspirations. 
Uh, this another person said they were afraid to take the class as a non-native person, uh, concerned that they might not have a place being in the conversation would be disrespectful. But this made me feel like I could contribute something, like working and burning or just transferring information to my friends about the challenges discussed in this class. I'm more comfortable addressing things that are uncomfortable. Another found the course is deeply important, relevant to all types of educational pathways, thought it should be a requirement. Um, someone found it the most impactful to their education at UC Davis. So we're really happy with that and there's a, a lot more we want to build into the course. I think both the course and the workshops, you know, the message really comes through of learning ethic of relationship, reciprocity, care and responsibility. As Ron uh, spoke at the workshop when we were there in February, you know, he was saying to some of the other agencies, you burn once and you leave, we burn and we keep coming back. And we find that to be the same in different places where we collaborate with, with land stewards, uh, that caring for land requires tending over time. And it requires a lot of preparation of the land. This is uh, a picture here working the last couple weekends up at the Maidu Summit land in Tasmam Koyam in the Northeastern Sierra and the board chairman Ben Cunningham uh, tending burn piles there. We've been cleaning up kind of a, a lot of slash that was there after previous harvest uh, by, by the previous landowner and making room for planting native plants and for eventually doing low intensity burns once the land is prepared for that. So after we're able to burn too, traditional burning requires ongoing care and harvest after each burn. It's a, just an ongoing relationship and process. And I think through all these different collaborations, it's clear that students and community members can contribute respectfully to these efforts. Um, this is a picture of after we were doing the clearing and burning in this site in Humbug in the Northeastern Sierra and Tasman Koyam, planting some of the native plants after mixing in the ash. The soil will be really rich there. So in a, a bigger view, um, I see a, that there's a lot of importance in educating future environmental managers. Um, many of the students and, and community members that come out to the workshops are environmental managers or moving towards careers in that field. And we are in a context, of course, of increasing temperature and aridity and catastrophic fire risk. And I think helping people uh, really learn to directly on the land um, and, and respectfully about the importance of native lead restoration has multiple benefits for ecology, for local employment, empowerment, and addressing a, a history of oppression and exclusion that we can see the results of on the land when we see overstocked forest and risk of catastrophic fire and, and you know just the the results of removing people from the land and and downplaying or denying the importance of indigenous management. I pointed to Newsom's executive order on uh, healing and reconciliation. I think that one step towards that is, is uh, supporting indigenous led land restoration and land stewardship. And our future resource managers need to be trained in how to build respectful collaboration, how to fund and raise money for collaborative land restoration, and also how to support and facilitate transfers of land, not just access, but also transfers of jurisdiction to indigenous peoples and coalitions who will take care of the land. So a few policy directions. So we also, you know, in addition to learning in class and, and talking with, um, with leaders and experts and practitioners and learning on the ground with, with experts, um, we also look at policy. So traditional burning, what are different ways we can find to support it? Could it be, it is a climate mitigation strategy. Uh, are there ways to look at as they do in other places, providing payment to indigenous communities who conduct traditional burning in order to protect the land from catastrophic fire? Can carbon offsets be calculated and valued from the positive impact of traditional burning on reducing the risk of wildfire and therefore the, reducing the risk of the destruction of carbon storage? So those are some areas we're exploring. Um, at the state level and beyond throughout the Southwest, we're we hope to contribute to encouraging funding and regulatory support for, tr for traditional burning. We are very um, clear on trying to invite lots of different diverse partners to the workshops in collaboration with our hosts um, that might contribute to future support and future efforts. 
I'd like to see broadening the concept of desired future condition of what is the optimal condition of some of our different ecosystems and forests and landscapes to include diverse indigenous perspectives on the optimal condition and what it takes to get there. These classes and workshops also lay the groundwork for respectful exchange of knowledge. We call it bi-directional learning rather than knowledge extraction, but exchange um, regarding burning. And always encouraging support for indigenous leadership in traditional burning and developing institutions that recognize and support the necessi necessity of traditional burning. So some of our next steps are planning for our workshops and for our course, which we call Keepers of the Flame. And that's a name that I want to acknowledge again that Chris developed, Chris Adlam, um, next winter. So we'd like to add an evaluation component. We have already, I showed you some quotes from the students, but we haven't added an evaluation component for the community members who've attended the workshop. So I think that will help us keep improving. Um, we hope to expand to do some work in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and also supporting our partners initiatives. So any of our collaborators that we work with who are engaged in trying to establish or expand land stewardship contracts to facilitate land transfers to protect lands that they are actively burning and caring for, um, finding support for their restoration projects. I think those are things we always want to contribute to doing. And then also always recruiting and funding graduate students to support and expand uh, this collaborative work. So thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Petro, so much. Um, and uh, for myself, it was an honor to work um, alongside Petro and Ron and, and see their work in action back in February. Anita Gobert and I were able to go out there and um, you know, get our hands dirty with them and just to see it in person and now see the pictures from you know, some of our work that we helped with and, and the uh, flowers that are in bloom, uh, it's uh, a good feeling. So thank you both for um, sharing your work. And um, I'm going to field a few questions from the question um, and answer section. Uh, so the first one on the top of the list is, when do the burns typically take place and how can we get involved as individuals? Uh, so Ron, can you repeat the question? Uh, when do the burns typically take place and how can we get in it, get involved as individuals? <laughs> well, my burns normally take are taking place in the winter and spring. Um, most of our where we're burning is under 3000. So therefore, come June, our burning is usually done. Um, we go back uh, a century or so, and it would be good if we could burn in the fall time. And, but the way that our climate has been in the past uh, few years uh, hasn't really been uh, allowing us to be able to do that. So this this right now, that's that's the time frame of when we do that. Uh, how do you get on a list? Well, I've got a whole bunch of people on the list that I don't even get to to be able to invite. So I apologize to all of them. But at the same time, like I said, we had 100 out there this last time. And March got stopped. And we were already at 66 and growing on that one. So basically, put your name in with someone and say you're interested. And we'll try to keep track of you. And so that when burns do come up, um you know we we try to bring you in best we can so uh just stay in contact with us and let us know you're you're interested and there are more people within the state that are actually burning and more i'm i'm hoping that are going to be burning especially tribally and then along with the agencies so I got brave enough this time to even invite Cal Fire, you know, that, that, it, so that was pretty big. But uh, in that, and the whole idea is is that, uh, that when we're out there burning, these folks need to know what we're doing as well and how, how that's being done. So that's my answer. Okay, thank you. Second question is, um, what resources are available to tribes who want to build up their own fire program? Um, an example would be acquiring PPE or a training and qualifications for staff.
Um, I apologize. I'm having a hard time hearing you, but just repeat one more time. Um, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It says, when do the, uh, what resources are available to tribes who want to build up their own fire programs? Um, an example would be acquiring PPE or training and qualifications for staff. Um, it's a very good question, first of all. Unfortunately, as you heard uh, Beth Rose speak about building partnerships, and that's basically what we do with the colleges, because the colleges usually have some funding. Uh, a normal burn will cost me between five and ten thousand dollars for a weekend. And, you know, if, if I can't get some of that covered, then that means it comes out of my pocket. We try for grants and basically fail. Um, those folks that are putting grant funding out, they are not all out on the land burning, so therefore they don't understand um, what we're doing. Um, as far as training is concerned, that's a part of also what we do when I'm out there, and I'm sure that is happening elsewhere with burns that Beth Rose is on. Uh, the, the tribal people are, are conducting the training, but uh, taking that a step further, uh, I, have a, I have a program in which um, with the Sierra National Forest, we have an agreement to be able to put fire out on the land and we're working on that. But a part of that master agreement is that we do our own training. We will certify our own people uh, because what happens is that many times they have certification programs and then when they get done, then they wanna bring them out to me and ask me to retrain them. <laughs> so it's like, no, you know, better off if I just train them from the beginning. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, after a burn, um, have you seen an uptick of invasive plants that crowd out the native plants? If so, how has that managed? Some invasives are very tough, as we saw in, the in my PowerPoint with the California daughter. Um, Star thistle is another. Uh, I, that same star thistle that we just burned this year, I burned it before. And so uh, they sometimes like fire. <laughs> and so, and they have a lot of seed on the ground. So they're very tough. What happens though in like the, we were getting rid of the tarweed and, and minimizing that, the flowers are all coming out. The grass is coming out. So the native plants eventually will push the invasives back and uh, very hard to get rid of invasives totally. I have one meadow that we've been on since 2003 and we have uh, Scott's broom and French broom and you know and we're, we're constantly pulling on these brooms and getting them out of there. They, they just, they don't go away, <laughs> they're tough. So, but you just stay after them and, you know, the same with thistle, you just stay after it until you can at least keep it minimized, but they don't go away. I think it speaks too to the maintenance aspects. It's a, you know, ongoing process. It's not just a, a one-time burn and then the native plants come back, of course, as Ron was saying. You have to be out there, you know, continually weeding and taking care of the area. Thank you. Uh, another question is, have these burns created a buffer area to wildfire? Have the burns created a buffer? Yes, yeah. to wildfire. Uh, definitely. I, I spoke a little bit to that in the terms that when you get new growth, that new growth is going to retain water and retain water at the surface. So not only is the resource that you've been burning um, gonna be restoring that 
storing that water at a higher level to the surface, so are all the grasses and medicine plants and everything else that's coming up. Uh, and basically, saying it's over the last three or four years, we've been burning about 10 acres uh, a burn a season. And so, you know, you start looking around and you've got 10 acres over here, 10 acres over there, 10 acres here, all that spread out over a 40, 50, 100 acre piece. That creates a very nice buffer. Okay, and there are questions along the lines of this. Um, have tribes been able to quantify positive effects on water tables associated with sulfur burns to justify a special request for state water board funding? I think that was a little hard to hear you, Althea, but I think I can see the question here. Um, yeah, it's the last one on the, the list. Yeah, so have tribes been able to quantify positive effects on water tables associated with cultural burns to justify potential requests for state water board funding? I don't know, but I think that's a great question. What do you think, Ron? I think it's a, a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I do meadows, and we've restored meadows, and we brought the water back, and we brought the plants back. Folks that go out to measure uh, meadow water, I don't believe that they're measuring correctly, no matter what university they come from. And the reason why is because of their, the way that they're calculating it. And so what they're not calculating is um, the continual percolation of the water once the plants are drawing them to the surface. So you can take trees, large trees, oaks, pines, they can reach down two meters, that's six feet for water. So when you have, when you're in the middle of the summer or middle of the drought, your water table is, is quite low. Well, these trees can reach down there and, and, and get a drink, but plants cannot. They can only go one meter at the most, flowers, less than that so every so all these different things have to have that water pretty high to the surface well once everybody's in there pulling that water and keeping that water to the higher level then that's when you have uh, the the ability for all the new vegetation to sustain and, and be alive and stay alive but that's hard to monitor. All right, thank you. Um, um, hopefully everybody's able to hear me okay. Um, so we are at the top of the hour. Um, we thank you for all of your questions um, and we will um, follow up with the questions that weren't able um, to be answered today. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to Beth Rose and Ron for um, presenting. Um, and for everyone on the call right now who joined us, um, we send out our, our gratitude to you and your support in the work that we're all doing. Um, and in re um, respect to your work, um, we are here as a support system to you. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and we will let you know um, about, about future uh, engagement. Um, if you want to follow our newsletter, you can find it on our website. All webinar recordings um, can be found at the link on the screen. Um, and when you exit the webinar today, a post survey will pop up. Um, so please take the time to uh, fill that out and sign up for our newsletter um, and definitely keep in touch. So thank you, everybody. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ron and Beth Rose. And thank, thank you, Yeah.